What we are going to discuss today is to talk about GDPR uh, and specifically what GDPR means for marketing consents. Uh, I'm guessing by the fact that you're all on this call that you may know about uh, GDPR, you may even know what, what impact it has uh, on marketing consents, but it's fair to say there is going to be significant changes uh, brought about by these regulations in what it means, what counts as someone giving you consent to contact them. So this will have a big impact on who you can uh, contact uh, from May 2018 next year. Um, not just prospects, but customers as well. Um, and not just future people, but e uh, existing contacts you have in your database at the moment. It's clear there's a big risk here. So a big risk that it could really um, hamper your marketing efforts and really restrict the number of people you can contact. But there is also an opportunity here as well. And this is why you'll see this described as engagement plus on the slide. There is an opportunity to use this as a moment to actually create a more engaged marketing list. And we'll talk about how you can do this as well as protecting your existing list. Very shortly, I'll pass over to my colleague, Ben Robinson, who will give a bit more detail about what the new regulations mean and the impact this will have on consents. I'll then come back in, I'll explain what behavioural science is and why it applies to this situation and how it can help uh, address the problem. And then finally, my colleague Dan Berry will come in to talk about a tool we've developed which allows you to test and try out new ways of gaining consent. Um, and he'll talk you through some examples of work we're doing with other businesses at the moment who are already trying to address this challenge. We're aiming to speak for about 30 minutes today. Um, we'll take questions at the end. I know a couple of people have already emailed in questions in advance, which we'll come to at the end. If you do have questions as we go, you can type them in to the Q&A uh, bit of the screen, uh, and then we'll pick them up at the end. But otherwise, we'll, we'll just ask at the end of the uh, conversation. A couple of things to note. This is being recorded, so we can send this to you afterwards. Um, and if I could just remind everyone, if you can go on mute, that would make it easier so everyone can hear. But thank you, I will now pass you over to Ben Robinson. So yes, GDPR is a very broad piece of regulation. It covers the, the new 4% fine for breaches into our notification window, broader definitions of what personal data is and technical areas, um, data portability. But as Matt says, we're not chiefly interested with compliance, but how compliance is going to affect you from a, a marketing perspective. From a marketing perspective, the chief change is around consent. Now, for those of you in the UK, on your screen now is how the ICO uh, describes the changes. And they pull out two things. The first is this new idea of unambiguous consent. And the second, it must be clear affirmative action. And this is a few consequences. The first is that consent uh, cannot be bundled in with, with other terms and conditions. It also can't be a precondition for a service. It must also be opt-in, not just opt-out, and that means uh, no pre-checked boxes. Uh, consent also won't last forever anymore. The fact that you did business with someone in 2009 doesn't necessarily mean that you can continue sending the marketing material in 2019. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, this, this change to the definition of consent doesn't just apply to, to new uh, prospects that you gather, it applies backwards to all your existing marketing contacts. So anyone in your database where you cannot show and have a record of them giving you this unambiguous GDPR level consent, you will have to reapproach to get their consent before May 2018. And if they either don't give you that consent or if they don't reply at all, you'll have to remove them from your marketing list. So what does this mean in practice? for marketers? Well, it means changing copy and processes wherever you're talking to prospects and clients about consent. And the, the, the first and for many businesses most important of these is one I've already discussed about going through your existing marketing lists and finding where consent isn't up to the GDPR level standard and reapproaching them, what the ICO in the UK calls refreshing consent. But you also need to make copy changes wherever you're dealing with consent. That might be in your contract with clients, the contact us 
pages on your website. It could be in the copy uh, where you invite people to uh, events. But also if you're a business that deals a lot in face-to-face -face interaction and values personal relationships, there'll also be processes you'll need to change around how do you turn a business card into consent to contact. So this all seems quite technical. We're talking about details in copy that are changing and, and specifics of consent and the regulations. Um, but what this means in practice is that we're moving from a world where inaction by your prospects and your clients generally has meant in the past that they will stay subscribed to receiving your material, your marketing materials, to one where inaction means that they're opted out. And that is a fantastically powerful change. And in fact, we've seen uh, research that suggests only 29% of consumers will, will opt in under GDPR level of consent. But we've seen marketers we've spoken to have tried this have uh, figures as low as 5% and, and other estimates are around that area. And, and chiefly what we're trying to do here is get that 29% level as high as possible. Now there's one more uh, nuance to this. There are two stages to the way as marketers you're going to be responding to this challenge. We're in quite a nice window now, between now and May 2018, where you can experiment. You can continue to go to existing marketing contacts under current consent rules, under the current regulations, as many times as you want, and test your copy and how you're communicating with them to get your uh, marketing list as, as healthy as possible. But after that May deadline, we're in a one-shot world where you have one chance to convince people to be on your marketing list. And for, by that point, you want to have your copy and your messages as tuned as possible. So finally, we're now going to go on to talk about how we solve this problem. But just to summarize very briefly, there are three steps to it. First, we're going to use behavioral science to redraft all your copy, your forms, your processes to improve your ability to retain and gain consent. Second, we can test these theories, these ideas in a safe environment hosted by us away from your website and tested with a sample that's matched to your current target list that doesn't involve your existing customers. And finally, we're going to implement the most effective solution we've tested and gradually improve it with you by A-B testing it. Great. So as Ben's outlined there, um, obviously these regulations will have or potentially have a very significant impact on uh, the number of people you're able to send marketing materials to, both going forward and looking backwards at your list at the moment. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about why, why behavioural science is relevant to this as a challenge. And I will give it a bit of an explanation uh, of behavioural science to kind of bring that to life. But I think it's important to say that actually behavioural science is behind the fact that this, there will be this drop in the first place. Um, you would have thought, well, if I ask someone to opt in rather than just giving them the ability to opt out, surely that won't make any difference. If someone wants to be part of my marketing list, they'll want to be part of it. Well, the science shows that actually, you know, fundamentally, we're quite lazy people and we'll go for the default option. And that's often what's been used in marketing consents. If a box is already pre-ticked, you don't bother to untick it. And that's really what the regulators are trying to stop. They want you to actually make an active choice. So what we're going to look at with behavioural science is how can we persuade people to make an active choice? How can we actually get them to want to sign up to your materials? But to explain what behavioural science is, some of you may, may have heard of it, some of you may have not, some of you, you know, may have read some of the famous books that look about behavioural science. But very simply, behavioural science for us is the intersection of um, neuroscience, psychology, sociology and economics. It's all about what we do, why we do it, and how we influence that behavior. Uh, the fundamental point really is that, you know, whilst the human brain hasn't advanced that much in the last thousands of years, our understanding of it has changed hugely in the last 10 years or so. And we're now able to create much better policies, products, and communications based on how people really do think and behave rather than just how we think they should think and behave. And this is incredibly important because um, People do often act in ways that are surprising and seemingly irrational. 
So we can all think about going through our daily lives. We see people behaving in ways that we wouldn't have thought. You know, economics would tell us they would behave. We don't. We all don't save enough for our pension. We all, you know, don't exercise as much as we should do for our healthy lifestyle. You know, we all act in ways that are a bit surprising. And this is what behavioural science truly tries to do: is understand why that is, and are there any patterns in that behaviour? A very quick example, just to bring us to life a little bit. Um, I'd like you all just to think for a second. How many decisions do you think you'll make about food today? Now, on average, people guess that they make about 14 or 15 decisions a day about food. So, you know, what am I going to have for lunch, dinner, breakfast, how much, when, those types of decisions. In reality, studies into this have shown that people make about 220 decisions a day about food. So more than 15 times as many decisions as you think you do. Why is this? Well, there are so many decisions you are just not aware of. There are so many decisions you made during a day not to eat. So when you've come into work this morning, you've gone past numerous places where you could get breakfast or get a coffee. You haven't stopped outside each of them and made a long considered decision about whether you're hungry or thirsty. You've just walked past them. But your eyes have seen these places. Your brain has made a decision. It's just in your subconscious. And this is the point. There are so many decisions you're making throughout your day that you're just not uh, aware of necessarily. The reason for this is it's estimated your brain is bombarded by about 11 million bits of information per second. But your conscious brain can only process about 40 bits of information. So only a tiny proportion of the information that's coming through your eyes, your ears, your senses um, every second is actually being processed by your conscious brain. So what does your brain do to avoid you know, breaking down, to avoid being overloaded? Well, what it does is it uses shortcuts. Um, it focuses on what seems to be the most important information and brings that into the conscious brain. But it also looks for patterns, quick ways of making decisions. So it doesn't have to process everything. It just processes a bit of information and tries to make a quick, intuitive decision about that. In effect, what your brain is trying to do all the time is to join the dots. Now, luckily, our brains are very good at joining the dots. So on the whole, we make good, quick decisions that don't involve deep, logical thought about every piece of information that comes through. However, there is a challenge that sometimes your brain joins the dots incorrectly. So it sees patterns that aren't there, or it makes decisions that actually, if you were consciously thinking about it, you wouldn't make. But because it's making them intuitively, it's making the decision that it's actually not in your best long-term interest. Well, I'm going to go into a tiny, tiny bit of the science here, uh, just so I think it helps explain it a little bit. Um, just to understand in, um, how people think, it, it's commonly accepted that we can understand how people make decisions and how they behave, uh, that we have two systems of our thought operating in our brains at any one time. So we have system two, which is our slow, rational, thoughtful, more deliberative way of thinking. Think of that as your Sherlock Holmes type brain more classically rational. And then we have uh, system one, which is our fast, automatic, more emotive, more unconscious way of thinking. Think of it as your, your Homer Simpson type brain. Now, most of your decisions are made by this fast system one Homer Simpson type brain. So if you think back to those, the food decisions, the vast, vast majority of those decisions are made in this part of your brain. You are using your Homer Simpson type brain much more than you think you are. And often you're not aware of these decisions. So what we try to do with behavioral science is understand those fast decisions you're making. Are they the right decisions? How can we encourage you to actually use your other type of thinking? Or how can we encourage you to make the right decisions that you would do if you were using your other type of thinking? Now, that's all very good. That's a bit of you know, the science. But how does this apply to comms? What does it mean for us as communicators, as, as marketing professionals? Well, I'm going to give you an example of how applying behavioral science and understanding this way of thinking uh, tackled a, solution, uh, a challenge very similar to the one we're talking about today. Uh, and this challenge is how did we get people to sign up for the organ donor register? Now, it's a similar challenge because you're getting people to sign up for something. What's interesting about the organ donor, and people based in, in, in the UK will know this, is you have to actively give your consent to be an organ donor. You have to sign up for a register. Some countries you're automatically opted in, but here in England in particular, you have to uh, actively opt in. Uh, 
Now, when you survey people, 90% of people say they support organ donation and would be willing to donate their organs. But less than a third actually sign up to the register. So a big difference between people, what people say they would do, would like to do, and what they actually do. But it is something people really care about. So what the, uh, the NHS did with uh, my colleague Dan Berry when he worked with them was look at, okay, well, can we apply behavioural science to, to close this gap, to get more people to do what they want to do, which is sign up to the organ donor register. The first thing they did was change where you can be prompted to make this decision. So now when you apply for your driving licence or car tax online, a screen comes up prompting you, would you like to join the organ donor register? And this obviously makes a difference, you know, it forces you to make a decision. But even then, they weren't quite getting the results they wanted, so they looked at the messaging around that. So when you get that screen that pops up, what message might make you, uh, make you more likely to sign up for the organ donor register? So they tried eight different messages. I'm going to go through these very quickly, but I think it just brings to life how behavioural comms can uh, impact a uh, situation. So the first message they tried was a simple control message. Please join the NHS organ donor register. The second one introduces a social norm, and social norms are very powerful behavioural insight. You know, we like to follow the crowd. So the message says, every day, thousands of people who see this page decide to register. Message three, same message, but this time, um, so the same social norm message, but this time a picture, a picture of people like you is included with it. Number four, same message again, social norm, but this time a different picture. This one is a logo of the NHS which obviously there's a strong emotional attachment to in the UK. Message number five, negative framing. So three people die every day because there are not enough organ donors. Message number six, positive framing. You could save or transform up to nine lives as an organ donor. Message number seven, reciprocity. So this sense of give and take. We're hardwired as humans to respond in kind to the behaviour of others. So this message says, if you need an organ transplant, would you have one? If so, please help others. And then uh, finally, message number eight, a call to action. So we said lots of people support organ donation but don't actually um, commit. So this message says, if you support organ donation, please turn your support into action. Now, there's quite a few people on the call, so I'm not going to ask you to kind of give me your guesses about which was most successful, but maybe just think about which one you would go with if you were trying to encourage people uh, to donate organs. Now in front of you, you can see the ones that were most successful and least successful. So actually, the social norm in the picture uh, uh, in this, uh, this test was the least successful. The most successful message was reciprocity. So as I said, this sense of give and take, getting people to think, would I be willing to take an organ from another person? Well, yes, I would. Well, therefore, I should be willing to give one as well. Now, the difference between these two messages is an extra 96,000 donors per year. So they've tested this. This was tested with over a million um, uh, people who went onto the website and now it's been rolled out across, uh, across the NHS. Using behavioural informed message can make a huge difference because you're tapping into the real drivers of someone's behaviour. So here it's reciprocity which really will drive someone to donate an organ more than other messages. So hopefully that's just given an example of how applying behavioural science to your messaging can really change the behaviour of what people do. I'm now going to pass on to Dan Berry, who's going to talk about, well, how can we apply this specifically to marketing consents and GDPR? Okay. Thanks, Matt. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Dan. I'm in the team with Ben and Matt, and I get to bring these two parts of the call together now. So, Ben uh, set out at the beginning the challenge we have particularly around um, getting people to sign up. Um, so, it's not about whether you're compliant. It's about once you're compliant, what's the best way to get the most people to give their consent? Um, and then bring in the, the behavioural science approach. So that last example Matt gave from the work uh, we did in the NHS. Um, are there uh, approaches we can draw from behavioural science to help crack this problem? And the answer is yes. So uh, the three of us have been working on this at H&K now for nearly a year. Um, we've worked with businesses already and completed some projects. So that's what I'm going to spend the next five or so minutes talking you through the, the model we've developed and what we've done. So you can see the real impact this has. And, just to recap, it's this number is, is what we're trying to tackle. Um, we want to we boost this number. So if only 29% of people are saying they would actively consent, what else could we do to boost that number? And let me show you, I'll show you exactly what we've done. So firstly, um, the approach we're taking. 
um, and then I'll hone in on the model we've developed. So the approach we, we take really begins by working with with you, a, a business, charity, whoever, to really understand what, what is your challenge specifically. So is it as you acquire new customers or donors or business contacts? So for instance, you meet people at a conference, you get a business card. Is it when people are buying a product online and you want to tell them about other products? Whatever that is, we work with you to define that challenge. It might alternatively be more about retaining the ability to contact your, your existing clients, customers, um, contacts in whatever way. So we work with you to, to finalize that. Then we hone in on the behavioral solutions. So um, we've reviewed all the published evidence we can find around uh, the, this particular type of behavior, I think 40 plus published papers, and then built in our um, behavioral science model, which I'll mention in a second. And then the final bit, which I'll break into two to give you specific examples of what we've actually already done with uh, businesses we've worked with, is how we know what works. So this is the evidence that we can give you so that you're confident that a particular approach works for your, your customers, your clients. Um, so the example Matt gave a moment ago about organ donation, you know, we had such a, a great effect just by changing effectively 12 words what are those 12 words that work for your customers? That's what we need to test properly so that you're confident those are the right 12 words or the right prompt. Um, what I'll pick up now is um, how we generate that evidence. So these in, in two ways. Firstly, we can run a simulation. So we can set up something in a safe environment away from your real customers or away from your real databases if that's a bit of a you know a bit complicated to get involved with right now but we can replicate that in a really reliable way um, and we call this approach the model we've developed um, smarter so the, the the back end of this of this approach is uh, we can focus particularly on your types of contacts so we can segment to the exact types of customers or contacts that you need to work with um, based on their profiling age, it could be um, type of workplace they're in, income, whatever. Um, we then draw in that evidence that we've reviewed over the past year to, to understand as best as we can what actually works in this situation. Um, and then we apply insights from behavioral science. And I'll just flash up quickly here what some of those are which make up this smarter simulation model that we're referring to. These are the insights from behavioral science that inform what could work. It helps us understand the problem. You know, why aren't um, real people in real life who may really want to hear from you, why aren't they still uh, giving you that active consent as they'll need to under the new regulations? Um, and it helps us come up with the solutions. So again, just like with the organ donation, um, we can use these insights from proven, well-established behavioral science um, concepts and apply them to help crack the problem. So that's the back end, the sort of clever bit, which we're building with a way to test it properly. And the front end of that is what you'll get is something tailored to precisely the context in which you ask for that, that consent from your contacts. So let's say it's people buying a product online or, or on your website somehow, you might typically see that sort of message that's on the screen, you know, a standard sort of, would you like to hear from us and, and how often. That's what the front end of this looks like. It's tailored to your exact process, whatever that is. Um, it's the back end bit that's clever. It's a um, reliable way to test, um, reliable experimentation method, which I'll give you a specific example of now. And then with all those insights backing up, so we really understand what's influencing people and how we can then influence influence them. So that's just a bit of a, the context, the model we've we've developed and can tailor to particular businesses. And I'll show you one of the first approaches we we uh, applied this for. So this was a project we finished a couple of months ago with a business that's a building society, so a big UK building society. And this is the front end of what they got. So the challenge this building society has is they would like to send marketing materials to customers um, who say sign up for a new savings product. This building society also wants to send them information about other types of products they sell. So that's sort of cross-selling. Um, 
And the main way they uh, are able to do this when they speak to new customers is during that sign up process on their website. So imagine you yourself, you're opening a new savings account on a building society website. Part of the way through that process, you'll see a typical consent question. And this is um, a mock up of what it is for that building society. What we did with them, and it's exactly the approach we can do with other businesses, is we recreate that exact setting. So for them, it was to recreate the process of opening a savings account, simulated, not real, a simulated setting, but very realistic. Um, that's, that looks and feels exactly like the real process. And then we test different behaviorally informed messages to see which one or which, uh, which message or which approach precisely gets most people to actively give their consent. So it's compliant with the new regulations. In this case, we recruited a thousand members of the UK uh, population and with a profile very similar to this building society's typical customer base. So we had the same sorts of people interacting with the same sort of process that this organization has, but we were able to test different ways to get them to sign up. And what we did actually, we developed, um, we used the behavioral science in our model to develop nine different approaches. So like Matt showed you with organ donation, we, for that we developed eight different approaches, just messages. Here we actually developed nine. And the beauty of our product is it's very easy and safe to test and retest again because it's, it's a simulated safe setting away from real customers and real processes. So we're able to test a lot of different approaches. Um, all of them were compliant with the regulations. That's really important to underline. Um, but which one is the one that gets most people to sign up? And I'll just show you one that we did. So I know some of the text on the screen is a bit small, but I'll just, just to give you a flavor. One of the different approaches we tested was the frequency in which this, this building society offered to send marketing updates to their customers. So we gave people a choice. Would they like to sign up for something once a week, once a month or, or not at all? So the question then was, by changing the, giving someone a bit more control about precisely what they receive, maybe that is a way to encourage them to sign up to receive anything at all. And so we tested variants of that sort of thing and different messages. Um, we had a great result. So this was, I say, very robust um, evaluation here. So we can be quite certain this building society could be quite certain that what we tested really does apply for them and their customers. Um, the, the relative improvement between the, the best new consent message we developed in our model and the sort of standard option was 38%. So if we think back to that number that Ben and I both mentioned that, you know, only about 29% of people are signing up. We can really drastically improve that just by making a very tailored and clever but simple change to precisely how this building society asks people to give their consent. Um, what our model also does is allows us to learn a bit more about people than just whether they gave their consent or not. So we, what we don't want to do, with, I imagine you guys are the same, you don't want to just drive numbers but from people who feel they've been tricked into signing up, you know, low quality contacts. So. Uh, through which you'll never have you, your chances of a follow through uh, diminished. So we also tested um, the views of the people who signed up. So did, what were their views of the company, of the process, of um, the website itself? This was a, a website simulation. And we saw no detrimental impact. So what that means is we can be quite certain that in this case, the business was getting more people giving their consent actively, but they're happy to do that. They weren't feeling tricked or manipulated. So these are high quality contacts. And finally, um, again, our model allows us to learn more about how different types of people respond differently. So for instance, we found that older people um, respond quite differently to uh, the general population. So what we could then do is further increase consent rates if we're able to target different consent messages to different types of people. So for instance, if when you're working with your uh, customers or contacts, you know something about them like their gender or their age or perhaps their wealth or how you've worked with them before, you'll be able to further boost how they can, their, their consent rates if you can tailor that consent rate to them a bit. So those are the things we're able to learn from this model we've developed. So very evidence-based, very tailored, um, but does it work? 
And in this case, fantastic result. Is there any backfire? Are we actually getting good quality signups? The answer was yes. And can you further tailor it to particular types of your customer base? And again, we can learn much more about that than um, just by doing regular testing. On the other hand, the second way we can work with businesses is to either skip that simulation phase, um, if it's something the business wants to do, and move straight into live testing. So it could be through your CRM, um, you're able to do A-B testing already. Um, we can then work with you. We're doing this with businesses currently. Rather than set up a separate simulation to actually test different message formats and prompts with your real life customers. That, that may be simpler for you to do. Um, but the core of our model is that simulation because it's something we can do alongside all the other work you're doing to stay, um, to prepare for GDPR. Great. So what does this all mean for you? How can we apply it to your business? And this brings us back to, to that slide right at the beginning where we talked about what are you already doing? What are you already changing? And how are you implementing this definition of consent in a way that's going to lose you marketing contacts? Now, every business is different and the challenge you'll have is, will be unique. But there's three broad different areas that we can help you that, that we've, we've covered. The first is cleaning those existing marketing lists so that when it comes to May 2018, you don't have to delete a large portion of your lists. The second is about post May 2018 and getting ready for that, making sure that where, wherever you do meet your customers for the first time or your prospects, you're putting your best foot forward and you have a message that's going to get as many people to consent as possible. And finally, Again, for those businesses that find personal relations are particularly important, that meet people in person, swap business cards, what are, what are the training, what are the nudges we can give to your staff to make sure they're asking for consent in the right way, but that, so that they're getting it? Great, thank you. So that's the end of our uh, presentation. Um, just to recap, we've talked about why the changes to GDPR will potentially have a big impact on your ability to contact um, people on your marketing databases. Um, and given examples of how behavioral science has tackled challenges similar to this in the past, but also what we've done to work with businesses already to uh, apply this to the, the challenge of GDPR. I hope this has been useful, giving you an insight into both the problem and how it can be tackled. I'm now gonna pass over to questions. So if anyone has a question they'd like to ask, uh, me, Dan and Ben, please let us know now. Okay, um, so we did actually have some couple of people send us questions in advance, um, which I think we kind of covered in the presentation, but we'll make sure we, we cover probably uh, now. One was, I think Ben, this is a question for you actually. Um, so someone has asked, um, it, still, it still seems a little fuzzy about some of the areas of the, of the regulations. Because this is going to have such a big impact, do we think that actually the regulations will get softened a bit, or at least the guidance on how these regulations are, uh, are inputted? Can I just ask everyone to put themselves on mute again, please? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I won't go into the specifics of the question we were asked, but there's, there's quite a few different um, I'd say last hopes that, that I think marketers have, have talked about. First, there was the idea that maybe Brexit for, for UK marketers uh, might be a way out, and then the ICO um, have confirmed that's, that's not the case. There's also discussion um, about legitimate interest, which is a technical part of the regulation. Perhaps direct marketing won't require consent and it will be considered a legitimate interest, but we've seen the, um, the direct, direct Marketing Association have, have quashed that idea broadly. Um, but there are lots of more broadly technical areas that people are hoping, and the most recent one is um, hope that maybe some of the consent guidance might change, the regulators might, might suddenly have a, a change of heart. And the, the thing to keep in mind with this is we are likely to continue getting guidance right up until uh, the deadline passes. But the direction of travel is is really clear. That as, as, as Matt said at the beginning, what the regulators want to do is they want to ensure that positive affirmative action has to happen to get consent. And we only have a very short period now in order to convert your existing contract the contacts and find a way to get that uh, consent. And the technical areas, I think, are very likely to be ironed out 
uh, when the EU's e-privacy uh, guidelines are updated to be in line with GDPR, when they're expected to, to just confirm that all marketing and direct marketing must require GDPR level of uh, consent. But the key thing is that we can't wait um, for all the guidance to, to clear up because it will be fuzzy until the very end and we need to get started on, on prepar pre preparing now. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Ben. I think that relates a little bit to the other question we've got, which is about the timing of this, given um, GDPR has taken up so much attention, just internal attention, just in terms of being compliant and uh, data protection, etc. Um, where does this need to fit in terms of timing when we're doing all this stuff as well? Do you want to pick that up, Dan? Yeah, so this, this has come up a bit, and it's why we... Um, We've, we've got two approaches. Our model works in two ways. One, the thing I touched on right at the end, we can work with your uh, systems and your real customers to A-B test different approaches. So all, all compliant with the new GDPR regulations, but which is the best compliant message? But we tend to find actually that um, that's complicated given all the other things that you probably have to do right now. So that's why we're finding that this simulation model is more practical um, to do this year in advance of of the May deadline because we can do that entirely separately. So we can find similar customers and clients that you work with, but we'll develop that in a way that doesn't need to work with them, doesn't need to rely on your um, CRM or other systems that you might need to be working on right now. We can do it separately, basically. Okay, great. And uh, I think this is the final one. Another one's come in. It's about are there any ethical considerations around using behavior science and nudging. Um, I tell you what, I mean, I think I'll pick that one up quickly. Obviously, what we're, what we're not trying to do here is trick people into, into signing up. I mean, that's the whole point of these regulations is that um, you want people to be making an unambiguous, you know, active choice. What we're really trying to do is just to get people, people just won't be thinking about this. If you're going through an online application for something or, you know, you're buying something online, you've got this question at the end about signing up. The reality is people just don't think about this. They're just making a quick intuitive decision. So what you're trying to do is just um, give, uh, communicate in a way which makes that decision more representative of what they would actually like to do if they really considered it in more detail. So absolutely, I mean, this, this is built so it's GDPR compliant. As Dan said, all the messages we test are GDPR compliant. And it's all about actually get, creating a more engaged um, database rather than trying to just get numbers of people who then are not going to be engaged with you in the future. I, I could add to that actually the, the, the building society example I showed um, that building society they've got a very strong sense of their brand and how they work with long existing customers so people who've been with them for decades in some cases and they that's really important to them so they didn't want to do anything that would damage that in any way so it wasn't just about whether the messages were compliant but they really had to be um, really fit that that company's values and and that was that was quite straightforward to do actually it did mean we discussed the precise detail of what we were doing but um, we reached a, a point when they were really happy it did fit with the way they like to work with their with their long-standing customers okay great um, any final questions from people on the phone No. Okay. Well, we will. We're going to wrap this up now. We will follow up by um, uh, Lexi. Will send a, an email to everyone with the link to this presentation and recording if you want to listen to it again. And obviously, you can come back to Lexi. Um, um, or actually, I might send this out so you have my contact details if you want to come back and ask any specific questions. Happy to talk to you about your specific situation um, if that's relevant. But thank you all for joining. Thank you for your time. I hope it was interesting. Uh, and we will hope, and we will hopefully speak to you soon.